Um, my name is Spencer Schneidenbach, and I'm here to talk to you today about RESTful API best practices using ASP.NET Web API. Now, if you're not a web developer, if you don't use Web API, that's totally OK. Uh, a lot of what I, what I, what I talk about, um, you can apply to using RESTful APIs and knowing when they're good and bad, or apply them later. I talk a lot about a lot of theoretical stuff. So before I get started, I wanted to make sure that you all know that everything that I'm telling you today, the slides, links to the, all the things that I talk about, all available at rest.schneids.net. You'll also see my Twitter handle, at Schneidenbach, at the bottom right. I tweeted out a link, um, and it'll be on every slide. So if you want to take a picture now, that's cool, but it, you can see it, see it down here later, and then you can go to my Twitter and uh, check it out for yourself. All right, so I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about why I give this talk. Okay? So I give this talk for a couple of reasons. Um, first, I think the information is good. I think, it's, um, I think it's compelling, and I think it's interesting. But more than anything, it's therapeutic. This is therapy for me. This is therapy because I'm an integrator. It's what I do. I make software talk to other software. And I've used good APIs, but far and away, I've used way more bad APIs. And we're going to spend some time today making fun of those bad APIs. I'm going to give you plenty of good examples and plenty of bad examples. Right? And it's important. This is an important topic to talk about because at the end of the day, developers have the power of choice. Right? If you have an application, and your manager comes to you and says, we'd like to integrate text messaging into, your, into our application. You can either be a hacker and you know, network together 40 Android phones and put Linux on them and then you know, create your own text, text messaging network. You could do that, but you're probably going to go out and find an API to use, right? an API to consume. And there's lots of them for text messaging. So you're going to go out, and you're going to compare. And you're going to compare all of these, and you're going to look for a few different things right off the bat. right? You're going to look for how quickly is it to go from zero to make magic happen. And you're going to hear me say that a lot, make magic happen, because when you make an HTTP call and then you look at your phone and you see a text message, it's kind of a cool feeling. It kind of feels like magic, right? That's awesome. You're going to find out how quickly it is you go from zero to make magic happen. How quickly can I get things done? The next thing you're going to look for is how quickly is it for me to, how easy is it for me to go and learn stuff more about your API and manage problems or manage exceptions, right? Because inevitably, you'll probably make a bad call here or there. We all do. I certainly do. And so you're going to want to know, how can I solve those problems, right? So we're essentially looking for good documentation. And then you're going to look at the long-term benefits. Because you're a discerning developer, you want your company to do well, right? So you're going to probably look for things like uptime or talk about things like cost. You're probably going to look at the cost and compare the two. And this is really important, because at the end of the day, you're going to go to your manager, and you're going to say, hey, I found these text messaging platforms. I found these three text messaging platforms that we could use. And uh, this one that I found, immediately I could get, be productive right away, so you're not, I'm not spending a lot of time on this. Um, they have great documentation. They have a great support line. Uh, and the costs are similar. And your manager's probably going to look at you and say, OK. And you've become a customer for them. And that was in your power, because at the end of the day, you have the power of choice, right? You can choose to consume that API. Now, you may do $0.05 cents worth of text messaging. You could do $5,000 worth of text messaging, or pounds, from where I am, right? Um, I know that I integrated text messaging at a, at a client of mine a while ago, and they spend thousands a month. And a large part of the decision was mine to figure out what API is going to provide the best short and long-term benefits, right? Now think about that. That's on one side. That's as a consumer. But think about the other side. If you have an application that you work on that you need to provide an API for, what is it going to be, what is it going to take to create something that is better than the competition, right? You're going to be on the flip side of that. You're going to say, what can I do to make my API awesome? Make it well documented, make sure that it works, make sure that it's obvious and accessible, right, to uh, developers. So there's two sides of that coin. Because at the end of the day, API design is user experience for developers. Now, I, I thought of that yesterday, and I hurriedly typed it into Google like, oh, this is a cool thought. And then like, I found out 100 other people had said this already. So I'm pretty sure I read that like six months ago and thought, oh, this is an original idea. Um, but it really, was, it really made sense to me. Because if you're making an application, a web application, WinForms, whatever, you're going to keep your user in mind because you want them to have a good experience. You're going to make sure that the form is laid out properly and that the buttons are in the right place and that they have good visual cues to make sure that they're progressing through the application naturally. And you want to do the same thing, and you want to have the same thing done for you when looking at or crafting an API. It's the same principle. User experience for developers. 
because it's not hard. I mean, we're not, we're not shy folks, right? We're not shy people. If something's wrong with it, we're going to say something, right? I think this quote does a good job of summing it up. If you don't make usability a priority, you'll never have to worry about scalability, which essentially means like if, if, if nobody wants to use your API because it sucks that bad, then you're not going to have to worry about how quickly you can scale up 40 Azure servers to handle the additional traffic because it's probably not going to exist, right? You're going to hear some common themes in this talk. There's a few common things that you're going to see over and over again. You're going to see these. You're going to see a green check mark and a red X. You're going to see this a lot. The green check mark is a good guideline. And the red X is something that maybe you shouldn't do, or maybe you should avoid. Now, these aren't hard and fast rules. Nothing that I'm telling you is. But for 90% of them, you're going to apply 90% of what I tell you probably to your API, and it's going to work for you. There may be one or two exceptions here and there, and that's OK. You can manage by exception a little bit, sure. You're also going to hear me talk about simple is not easy. Making something that's really simple for your consumers to use is not an easy task. Crafting good. So, Yes, you could make, you can make an API, you can go file a new project in Visual Studio and make an API pretty quickly, and then install a package that displays help docs for that API, right? And that's good, you can do that in like 10 minutes, right? It's, it's quick, but it's not enough, because you're going to need to talk about authentication, you're going to need to talk about exception handling, you're going to need to document what weird little things about your API exist, right? Crafting good documentation takes time, and it takes thoughtfulness. And it's not easy, right? Making an API that's consistent, consistent from endpoint to endpoint. You make sure that you use put requests every time you want to update an object, right? Having those conversations with your team and with your manager, that takes time and it takes thoughtfulness. And it's not easy. But it's so critical. If you want people to use your application and use your API, you have to make it simple for them. But simple is not easy. You're going to hear me say that a lot. I'm also here to tell you there's no silver bullet. Anybody who stands in front of one, on, on the, one of these stages and says, this is the, this is the way and the light, you, know, you ought to think twice about listening to them, because I've never found that to be true. There's good ideas. There's bad ideas. There's sometimes when bad ideas are good ideas, right? So most of what I'm telling you is applicable. It's awesome. It's good information. But you're going to have your own exceptions. And like I said, there's no silver bullet. There's no magic answer. I can't tell you that there is one way, one light, right? So we need to talk about, if we're going to talk about RESTful APIs, we ought to talk about what REST is, right? REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and it was described in a paper by a guy named Roy Fielding. He did it for his PhD dissertation. Uh, and it essentially describes the architecture that is the web, okay? It, is, it essentially, it's not tied to a protocol, and it's not tied to a particular format, right? It's just a set of constraints a set of things that if you have these things in common with a system, it can be considered a RESTful system. And here's what they are. We have six constraints. We have the client-server constraint, which main, mainly just specifies that there's a client and there's a server. That's it. We have the cacheable constraint, which means that a response from a server can define itself as cacheable or not. It doesn't have to be, but it can define itself as cacheable. There's the statelessness one. How many folks are ASP.NET users? OK, fair amount of you. How many of you are ASP.NET Web Forms users? OK, come on. Now, if there's that many hands, you've got to raise them up. I know there's more of you in there. You're shy. I still use it, too. It's OK. All right. Web Forms is all right. It's, it's, it's had its time. I still use it, right? And when you use Web Forms, you store things, you store data between page requests and session state, right? And then it's stored on the server. You session state all the things. That is decidedly not stateless. Stateless means that all the state that's contained for a, is, for a given web request is contained within the request itself, right? So the request sends all the information. And in a purely RESTful system, the, re the server does not store anything, right? All the data that it needs is made in the request. A system can be layered, which simply means that a client can make a request, and it could come from the response to that request could come from the web server, a load balancer, a cache server, a CDN, and it doesn't really care. And it, it, the client doesn't care as long as it gets its information. Code on demand is the only optional constraint. And it simply means that at, on, at demand, a server can send additional code from itself to the client in order to enhance the experience or change the experience, the easiest example of that being JavaScript, right? And then there's the uniform interface constraint, which itself is made up of four constraints. 
which are important to talk about. So we're going to talk about them. Resource identification is the first thing. That means that a given resource can be identified by a URI, right? A URI or a URL, right? And so when you make that request, the server goes and it gives you back some data. In this case, I'm making a request for employee 1234 and I'm getting back a, a JSON object with the first name and the last name, right? And it's important to note that these are representations of the data. These aren't, these aren't the data itself. Right? It's not, if this comes from a SQL Server database, you know, it's not the, uh, the API is not telling you, oh, this is a SQL Server, and here's the table that it lives in, and here's the row number, and here's every attribute on that, right? It doesn't have any of that information. It doesn't give you back that. It gives you back a representation. But that's okay, because representations have meaning, and those representations can be used to manipulate the resources on the server, right? So if you did tick that, and you changed the name, and you sent a put request to the server, you could change, in theory, change the, uh, change the employee object. Content is self-descriptive, which means that the server tells the client what kind of content is being sent back. It could be JSON, it could be XML, it could be a CSS file, it could be HTML, right? The point is that it describes itself. It typically describes itself in HTTP inside of the, um, the, um, the content type header inside of the response, right? And the final one is HeyTOS, or hypermedia as the engine of application state. Um, which is important to talk about because in a RESTful system, a client doesn't know everything about what's going on in the server, right? If you go to google.com, the client is getting information from Google to say, I'm going to navigate to the, I'm going to navigate to maps, or I want to navigate to the shopping app, uh, the shopping area of Google, or I want to do a Google search. The client doesn't know all that stuff intrinsically. The server provides all the information that it needs, that the client needs to navigate. That's HeyTOS. And we're going to talk about how that applies to RESTful APIs, okay? Speaking of REST, what's a RESTful API, right? A RESTful API is just an API that follows the REST architecture, which I know is probably mind-blowing, but it really is that simple. But the term has a little bit been co-opted. It's been kind of, kind of brought on and kind of taken a life of its own, right? Because REST isn't tied. Remember, REST is a set of constraints. It's not a protocol. It's not, a, it's not a, tied to a particular format, right? It's not tied to JSON. It's not even tied to HTTP. Now, granted, most RESTful systems are HTTP systems, but they're not tied together. And when people say RESTful API, usually what they mean is a JSON, an HTTP API that returns JSON, or sometimes XML, and that's what people think. For the purposes of this talk, we're gonna talk as if, we're gonna go with the, the common definition or the, the well-understood definition. When I say RESTful API, I'm just gonna refer to an HTTP API that probably returns some kind of JSON or XML. We're gonna use JSON in all of our examples. So we're going to stick with that just, to, just for the sake of clarity, right? So I'm here to tell you, though, you, there's pragmatism involved, right? A purely RESTful API does not make it a good API, right? An API that strictly follows the REST standard, no, the REST constraint model does not make it a good HTTP API, okay? Or a good RESTful API. And I'll give you an example. HeyTOS is a perfect example. Hypermedia is the engine of application state. Um, so a lot, there's a lot of debate out there whether a JSON API or any API in general should send back links to related content inside of the JSON response. So for example, if you make a request for a customer, a customer, if you're an accounting system, has invoices associated with it, right? So you might send back a link to say, here's where you would get those um, invoices, right? You'd get, you, it would send back that link in the, in the header or sorry, in the response. But that has really limited usefulness because from an API cons consumption standpoint, you probably, if you need the invoice API, you probably already know how to access it. But that's a purely RESTful thing. So if they say, you know what, we've got to do pure REST. I mean, it can't be a RESTful API without HeyTOS, so now we have to spend all this time, and by the way, that's not an easy thing to do to implement on an AP HTTP or a RESTful API, right? It's not, it's, it takes a lot of extra work. And well, we have, to, we, we have to because it's RESTful. But if you get everything else wrong, if, you're, if it's poorly documented, or there's a lot of downtime, right, then your API, your API is probably not good, right? So I'm here to tell you to do what makes sense and throw everything else out. Okay, now let me ask you, is that vague enough for you, right? Like that seems pretty vague. That's not very helpful. And it's mainly because, again, there's no silver bullet. There's no, ant there's no one way, one path. What I say works for me, for, most case, for the most part, when I design APIs, it may not work for you, right? So we're gonna treat the API, we're gonna talk about how to build an API now, 
RESTful API. Let's get to building it or designing it, right? Uh, so we're going to talk about the design process. Now, I'm going to talk about it as if it's siloed to design, implement, document, maintain. Uh, in reality, you're probably doing all of these things at once, right? You're probably iterating, and it's probably one big circle, right? But for the sake of this talk, we'll just talk about these in the siloed way, right? All right, I've been practicing. So when it comes to API design, I have one rule. OK, I actually have two rules, but that sounds a lot cooler. And then I could put the dark night up on the slide, right? And it's keep it simple, stupid. Or if you're nice, keep it, simply, keep it stupidly simple, right? And again, simple isn't easy. But we're going to talk about some ways that you're gonna make, you can make it simple. And again, aren't easy. But you want people to use your API, right? So first rule of keep it simple, don't be creative. Let me give you an example of creative. Um, so when you're making an HTTP request to a resource, it's very common to get back some kind of error or some kind of response code other than just 200 to say everything's good, right? You might send a bad request to an API and they say, actually, you're missing the first name. We're going to send 400 bad requests. One example of creative is I know of an API where every single call that you make returns 200 OK. And the body of the, re the, body of the response actually contains whether or not there was a problem with that response, right? It'll actually contain whether or not there was an error. That API is also managed by a company called Facebook. So they can, have, they can be creative, right? They can be a little creative. But for the most part, you shouldn't be. You should follow the general rules and general guidelines that I laid out. Do what developers expect is the bottom line. Provide what is necessary, and no more and no less. Now, this is another example of it's really hard. Simple is not easy, right? So, but there's some general rules. So if you're an accounting application and you have an employee endpoint, and you want to return a list of employees. It's likely you don't want to return their social security number. If you're from the United States, I don't know if they have an equivalent here. I'm sure they do. Some kind of identifying number that's important that uh, is pretty sensitive information that you don't want to send back. On the other hand, you want to make sure that you send back enough information about that employee to be useful, right? You don't want to leave out their first name, right? That wouldn't make a lot of sense. But knowing what this looks like can be really hard. Again, simple is not easy. So you have to provide enough information for your, your consumer for, the informa for it to be useful, right? And then use a handful of HTTP status codes. The best APIs that I consume use less than 10, right? There's about 100 plus HTTP status codes. There's even one called I'm a little teapot, and I'm not making that. It's like 418 or something. Um, you could use that one, but nobody does, and you shouldn't either. And you should just use a subset. Use a good subset, right? And here's a few that you could use that are good examples. So 200 OK. You send it back with a Git request to say, everything's cool. Here's your response, right? Everything's good. 201 created. When you do a post request and you create an object, right? You could send back 201 created to say, yeah, everything's good. Your resource is created. 400 bad request, another common one. And I would argue the most important when doing integration work or doing API work, because if there's an exception, if there's a problem, getting this request and everything around it right, the bad 400 bad requests, getting that response correct is very critical. And it's just basically a way of saying your request wasn't any good. Just change if, and ideally, it would tell you how to change it and then send it back, right? And then it'll be good. And you can get 200 OK and move on with your life. Uh, 404 not found, of course, if, a res if you're asking for an employee that doesn't exist, 2345, send back 404. And then 401 and 403 unauthorized and forbidden, which folks tend to get mixed up, right? Uh, 401 unauthorized says, I don't know who you are. 403 forbidden says, I know who you are, and you can't do that, right? You can't look at that social security number. Here's an example. So this is my favorite part. These are the part where I get to tell stories, stories that are real. These are things, every example that I'm showing you of a bad API is an example that comes from a real experience, OK? So let's talk about keeping it simple in the context of this. So there's an API that I interact with where every one of their objects has a separate, has a name ID. And that name ID points to a separate ID on a name resource that literally only returns an ID in a string with the name, right? So in order for me to get the complete picture of this customer, I either have to do two requests, right? Or n plus one requests if I'm getting a list of customers, then I have to do, if I get a list of customers, and then I have to do to get the names of that. That's horrible. Why, why would you make me do that? That's not keeping it simple. That's awful. That's two requests per Git. And if I'm making the request, because the opposite is true, if I'm trying to create that customer, I have to create a name object first, 
and then I have to create the customer with that. What, what, what's the point? Why would you make me do that? Why would you make me do two requests for every single one of your objects? It's awful. The, bo the bottom line is don't let your specific Im implementations leak into your abstraction because at the, at the end of the day, an API is an abstraction, right? It's an abstraction over your system. And a lot of people say that abstractions leak, things like Entity Framework, right? That are good ORM tools, but they're leaky because they try to cover up all the you know, parts of SQL Server that nobody wants to know. So usually it's, they say abstractions are leaky, but the other's true too. They've let their implementation leak into their API. Because I, I happen to know, I asked them, I, they said, oh yeah, we store names in a separate table. And I said, okay, I, I can't really criticize that. They probably have a very good reason. Actually, for this particular company, they probably don't. But they probably have a very good reason, or they thought they had a good reason, for doing that. So I'm not criticizing their implementation. I'm criticizing the fact that they've not kept it simple for me as their consumer. I'd much rather see this, right? Just one request, one post request or get request to get the name. And then, oh, you know, the, the developer on the other end says, but, but, but then I have to like manage the name object myself. Yeah, yeah, make it simple. You wanna make it simple on me. You don't wanna make it hard. I'd much rather see something like this, right? Wouldn't you? You wanna make two requests for every object? I don't. How about this? I've put three words up on the screen. Theory, Annex, and Threshold. I've, given, I've told you nothing about them. You know they're English words, right? They're not American words, they're English words. But I didn't tell you anything about them. I just put them on the screen and I just expect you to know, or don't, of what they are. What if I told you that, and this is true, these are the names of my former neighbor's kids? Okay, how would you know that unless I told you? First of all, it's really weird. Okay, they also have Lilia, but Lilia is like a normal name, right? It's like the most normal of the names, right? The example's not nearly as funny with her first. But I didn't tell you this. I didn't give you any context. I didn't give you any context up front. You're left wondering what the words mean. How does that tie into this? I'll give you this. Okay, so I've put four more words on the screen. And as a, and as a developer, you look at that. As an engineer, you say, okay, those kind of mean the same thing, like inactive and deleted or inactive and retired. They're kind of similar. So maybe they describe different states of an object, right? It's either inactive or deleted or visible or retired, right? What if I told you that on several, one of the, several objects, these are four separate properties. These are four separate properties on each of those objects, right? Here's the best part. Not only is it not well documented what each of these individually mean, the developers don't even know what they mean in combination with each other. So if, oh, if something's inactive and visible, well, it follows this set of rules. What is that? Like, that's more, that's like 16 or 24 permutations, right? And they don't, they can't tell me what each of these mean if the object is in this different state. That's not keeping it simple. And they haven't even, they haven't even proved to me that the complexity of this is worth my time to manage. They haven't even documented it. They and they don't even know, honestly. So that's not keeping it simple, right? It makes me go like, ugh, this is just, ugh, gross, awful, awful API design. If you knew this company, you would not be surprised. Second big rule, be consistent. And honestly, this is really saying the same thing as keep it simple, right? Be consistent with accepted best practices and be consistent with yourself, right? Now, accepted best practices is a bit of a, well, best practice is a subjective thing, right? But it's up to you and your team if you're designing a RESTful API to do some research, do some talking, right? To kind of figure out which best practices apply. Typically speaking, you want to return 200 okay with, uh, with a good request and not 200 okay with a bad request, right? Like those are pretty common things. It gets a little murky, but you can, uh, you can form your own opinion. And then if you do it one way, stick with it. And if you have to deviate even a little bit, document, 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 right? But try to be consistent with yourself. If you say, I'm going to create all objects with put requests, which is, would be creative and bad, uh, then do it at least, at least be consistent across your endpoints. Uh, there's one in particular API that I can think of where instead of using put requests to update objects, they use patch requests. Um, and that's unusual. And speaking of which, let's talk about some HTTP verbs because they're at least the most common ones, right? Because there's like more than this, but I don't know what they are because I don't need to know because I'm trying to stay consistent, right? So get requests, just get data. That's all they do. Put requests are typically used to update data. So you're trying to update that employee, you, give it a, you do a put request, and then you update that employee, right? Typically with put requests, you send everything. You say, send all the properties. If it's missing a property, 
it assumes that you don't want that property anymore. And in theory, and what people expect is that the property would be set to null or whatever that equivalent would be on the backend system, right? Post requests typically used for creating objects, okay? I also see post requests used sometimes in place of puts. Uh, that's less common, but I have seen it. To me, I use put requests separately because it's just what developers expect, right? Delete, usually used for deleting individual resources. I saw an API once, though, uh, where they had a delete request that you could issue against the whole resource, so API slash employees, and it would just delete all the employees. Okay, I wouldn't do that. Um, I guess if you, you could if you wanted to, but it seems like a bad idea. And then patch request, which patch request just says, I just, it's like a put request, but you don't have to send everything back. It's less common to see out in the wild, but I do see it, and it just basically says, I just want to update these one or two properties, right? Remember to be consistent. Pick a way and stick with it. If you're going to insist that you do all your get requests with posts, if you're going to be that mean, at least like be consistently mean, right? And don't mutate data with GIFs, gets. I've seen enough, I've seen enough to call it out, okay? I've actually, I, we're, when you do a get request, developers expect that it's not gonna change anything, that you're only getting data from the server. But I've seen people do this. I've seen people mutate data with gets, and you shouldn't do that. Resource identification. Um, so we have a concept of nouns versus verbs, right? So we have nouns. Employee would be an example of a noun, right? Get all employees would be an example of a verb-based system. And I'm not talking HTTP verbs, I'm just talking word verbs, right? Uh, and here's what they might look like. You could get employee, get employees, get a single employee, or post to the employee's endpoint. Or you can create verbs, right? You could say get all employees, get employees with ID, get employee with ID, and so on. Um, generally in RESTful, so the, the one on the right, the example on the right, is more used in like SOAP-esque systems, and that's not a bad thing. Like I've used good SOAP APIs and bad REST APIs, believe me. Uh, but when it comes to creating a modern today API that people expect to use, use plural nouns, okay? Stick with the plural nouns because it's consistent, it's what people expect. Now, I promise, if you use singular nouns and you get everything else right, I promise you, I will not stand up on the stage and make fun of you. I really won't. But most people expect it to be plural. So if you're starting something greenfield, stick with plural nouns. But pick one or the other. Remember, be consistent. Yeah. So you get a customer. You want to get the employee, or you want to get the invoices under that customer, right? So there's a few different ways that you might consider doing that. You can get them, you can just return the set of invoices within the parent object. That's an option. Um, typically, that doesn't work very well unless you're returning a short list of things that doesn't change often. When you're talking about employees, especially in the context of an accounting system, sorry, invoices in the context of an accounting system, usually a customer will just keep accruing invoices and invoices and invoices. So you probably don't want to return it with the parent object because that list could grow to a thousand or more and then you're sending back data that they may not even be using, right? Especially if you're getting a list of customers, then you really don't want to do that. Much more common and much more what you should consider is just getting a sub-resource using, um, say, customers, and the idea of the customer, and then say, I want to get the invoices under this particular customer. It's a lot more common. It's a lot more common. Occasionally, I run across an API that uses expand. Um, typically, this is used for higher volume APIs where they're trying to control what data they send back. They, they want to be flexible and not have like 100 endpoints, but at the same time, they want to give the, the developer an option to get the invoices back with the parent object. Um, I would typically shy away from this for Greenfield stuff. I'd stick with um, the middle one, just set, make it a separate request, right? The expand parameter, I find too many consumers just say, oh, I'll just take all the things, you know, I'll just expand every possible option. And then what's the API consumer to do? It's nice for higher volume APIs, likely probably not necessary. But whatever you do, be consistent, right? And I'm just gonna just say that till I'm blue in the face. That and simple isn't easy and keep it simple, right? But consistency is key. But be flexible where it makes sense. And again, it's pretty vague, right? But like, I can't come up here and tell you that the answer to this particular scenario is the right answer for you. When we're doing Git requests, there are some things that we should consider about the implementation of our Git requests. We may want to sort the data, filter the data, or page the data. This is where I'm getting into a little bit of Microsoft-y Web API-ish stuff. So, you know, bear with me if that's not your bag. 
But in this case, we're doing, a, we're doing a request to the Contoso API. We want to get some people, and we want to order by name. So what, would, what we would end up with is a list of uh, people ordered by name, right? And um, this is using something called OData. This isn't built into Web API, uh, but you can use NuGet and install OData and hook it up to your controllers. It's very convenient. It's very easy. I like it. Um, you can also do things like this, or, or order by name descending. And you can also order by multiple fields, so it's pretty handy. Again, it's OData. You don't have to remember that, because you're going to rest.schneids.net or Twitter, right, to look this all up, because you don't want to remember this. Don't write down anything that you don't have to remember, right? Filtering. Filtering um, is actually pretty important. Um, so this is using the OData filter API. You don't have to use this, but we're, and we're going to talk about where you wouldn't, maybe. Um, but in this case, if, you're, if they know the names of the fields on the other end, you might do something like this, where you say, I want to filter, I want to say name, operator, and then whatever you're comparing it to, right? In this case, we're saying name equals milk. And this is extensible as well. You can do something like this. It's really useful, it's really handy. Um, and we'll talk about how that applies in a second. But again, you get this for free. Just Google this, right? Take a picture, grab the slide deck, whatever. Google this. It's, you get it for free in Web API. It's awesome. Paging is another important consideration you should make, right? If you want to get customers, it's, it's likely something that you will have to worry about. You will have to think about paging at some point, especially if you're returning a million records, you probably don't want to return them all in one go, right? So if you're getting customers, you might want to page the data. You say, I want page one, I want this many in the page. And here's what the result might look like. It might have a page number, it might have a list of the results, and it might have a link to the next page because you're a nice developer and you're like, I just want to make them, give them a while loop, while next page does not equal null, and you know, keep going and let them get as many as they want. Um, I also see limit offset used commonly um, in lots of APIs. Either's fine, just you know, pick one and stick with it, be consistent, right? Um, and typically, if you're implementing paging, it's because you want to put a limit on the number of records. I've used APIs where uh, they gave me a page and a page size parameter, and I had to use it, but they didn't put a maximum on the page size. So then I could just get all the records anyway. So if you're using paging, it's likely because you want to do some kind of filtering to keep, them, keep your API from returning too much data, right? There's a good paging example on my blog. Um, again, link, link below. Uh, but I have a paging example that I wrote up. OData has paging in it. Um, it's not my favorite implementation. I'm not exactly a fan of how it um, returns the data, so I usually just roll my own, OK? Do you need this? Do you need to sort page, sort page filter? Maybe. I, I, I don't know. What do your consumers need? That should be the first question in your API journey, right, is what do your consumers need? Um, I will tell you a couple of my opinions. So paging probably is something that you should consider. Sorting and filtering. So the thing about filtering is, is if you're giving them the power to filter on anything, if that query is being trained, if you're using it with Entity Framework, even better, because that translates to a SQL query. But if that's not indexed, and you're trying to filter on that, that can get a little hairy, right? Um, it's very common to include extra query parameters, to program it to make it so that you include extra qu query parameters to say uh, things like, I only want tools in this particular category, or I only want objects that were modified after a certain date, right? So that's pretty common. Sorting, weird, weird, and not common for integration scenarios, right? Because most of the time, I don't care what order the data comes back, I just want the data. Uh, but it might be useful if you're making like a front-end application, right, an Angular or Aurelia or something, uh, and you're making an API for the back end, you might want to implement sorting for yourself, right? That might be an internally consumed API where sorting makes sense. Versioning is really critical. It's really critical to at least think about, because your API should stand a test of time. Now note, I didn't say the test of time. I just said a test of time, because you have to keep in, keep in mind the life cycle of your REST API. It's not going to last forever. Now my mom, she's a COBOL programmer, and she works on systems that use AS400 and have since the 60s, OK? A little bit different. Your API is probably not going to last that long, right? Uh, but you have to keep that in mind. You have to keep in mind, is this going to be useful for an extended period of time? Do I plan on making a new one to address consumer needs in a couple of years? You have to at least think about that, right? And there's definitely, there's different ways to version your API. These are the ones that I see that are most common. 
Uh, so a lot of, no, nah, I wouldn't say a lot, a fair number of um, API implementers do something where they uh, do a Git request and you're getting or posting to customers. You, you post to the same URL, but you provide a version number in the header of the request, okay? It's a little bit, I, would, I see it, but it's, to me it's not obvious. It's not obvious that, especially if the objects have a different structure, if I'm expecting something different back on a Git request, um, it's not entirely obvious. So I don't like this strategy, but I do see it. I much prefer something like this, where you're putting the version number in the URL, right? So that way you're saying, I'm winning version one of this customer's API. And then I can say, if I need version two, great. I can just call a different endpoint. It's much more obvious. Um, here's something, here's an example of somebody getting creative. So Stripe is a payment processing API. It's pretty popular. Uh, and they use a mixed strategy. They have their major versions, um, segmented out by URL. But then if you have a minor version, like a tweak that you need, like some, some additional thing, they'll have minor versions of their API and you can distinguish between those inside of the header, which I think is kind of handy. You likely won't need to do that, but it's a creative example, so I threw it in there. It's kind of cool. Use URL versioning. It'll save you trouble, it'll save your consumers trouble. It's obvious, it's, more, it's much more obvious. Errors are going to happen. Problems with your API are gonna happen. The question is how are you gonna manage those problems, right? So let me show you an example that's a bad example. And it's using a real API, uh, changed you know, to protect the innocent or not. But I need to create a vendor. So I do a post request to create a vendor. But it requires name and the state, right? And I give it the, the name of the, the vendor, but I don't give it the state, right? I don't say Missouri or whatever. Then I get back a bad request that just returns application JSON. It says, this is JSON, and then it returns a string that says state is required. Okay, that's, a that's, an, that's an error message. That's something I can do something with. Um, useful, limited usefulness. We'll talk about that in a second, right? So let's do an, 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 a post to a different endpoint. So we're going to create an employee. It requires a first and last name. All right, and I just give it a first name because I'm just trying it out and see if I can break it. And then it returns back uh, 400 bad requests. It also returns back JSON, but it returns back to JSON object that wraps inside of an error message. It just says, your request was invalid, okay? Now, both of these examples are pretty bad examples. And this is a real API. Again, this is not something I haven't seen, right? Where they return one format on one end and one on another. And this is like, this is weird to me. So they're bad, so the first one is bad, because what if there's multiple properties that are invalid? I want to know about each of those so I can fix them, fix the problem that much quicker. Then on the other end, it wraps it in an object, which is sort of like a beginning, because if it's wrapped in an object, maybe it'll eventually return, or at least an array or something of errors, right? Um, but it doesn't even tell me what's wrong, right? A good combination that I see, a good approach, is usually to return like an array of errors that say, Here's an error with this particular property, and here's the error message. You know, it's either formatted incorrectly or entirely missing. I like this, error, this kind of error reporting. So again, I'll say it again, simple isn't easy. This is pulled from Twilio's documentation. It's a little hard to see, but what they return to you is not only do they return an error message, they return a specific error code that's tied explicitly to that error message, then they give you a link to the documentation on how to fix it. And phone numbers are weird because phone numbers come in lots of different formats. And actually, Twilio makes it really easy because you can give them a phone number that has parentheses or hyphens, right? And it doesn't really care. But if the bad, re but, but if, if you send in like, I don't know, a plus sign and you've got the wrong country code, that could be a problem. And so they give you a link back to some documentation that you can use to fix your problem. That's awesome. That's great. You gotta make confining and fixing errors on your consumer as easy as possible, okay? That's the bottom line. You gotta keep it simple for them. It's simple isn't easy, but you gotta keep it simple for them so they will use it. Let's talk about security. So I've got two facets that I wanna go over you know, fairly quickly. Is that in encryption and authentication? So the bottom line is you should be using SSL, all right? There's no reason not to anymore. You can get free certificates via letsencrypt.org right? And then you can automate it so that it perpetually requests new certificates and it works in perpetuity. I did that to my blog. If you go to schneids.net, you'll see that it's encrypted. Why did I have to feel the need to encrypt blog traffic? Uh, I, I don't really know. Uh, but I did it because it was there and it took me about four hours to do. So if I, it takes me four hours, it can take you like two, right? 
Use SSL and don't roll your own encryption, please. Don't roll your own encryption. And this is just like a general rule. All right, let me tell you a story. This is real. So there was an encryption library that um, had a vendor name and then it just said encryption.dll, right? It was the name of the software company. And then they said, okay, you need a key here in this text file. And then in your application settings, you need another key. Okay, so very, very cryptic, very like mysterious, like you need multiple keys, like this is really cool. And we were using it to in, in, encrypt social security numbers, sensitive data. And so I was looking at the social security numbers one day, not the real ones, just the encrypted ones, and I started noticing kind of a pattern. It's like, okay, they're all roughly the same length. No, they all are the same length. And uh, see the characters repeated over and over again. What they had for us was a library that essentially was a substitution cipher. They literally were substituting nine for like the Y with two dots above it. And I, and I noticed this and I, and I told my manager and he kind of laughed because he used to work there. Um, thankfully, he didn't touch that. But don't roll your own. There's plenty of encryption out there that you can use. There's plenty of encryption libraries. You will do it wrong. They will do it right. I would do it wrong. I just wouldn't try. And then pick an authentication strategy that isn't basic. Basic authentication meaning with your API, you send a username and password, which is common and pretty easy to get started. The problem is, is that basic authentication is like giving your keys to your house, to your house sitter and saying, I'm going to be gone for a week, so watch my house. And, you're like, and, the, and the sitter's like, okay. And then you hand them the number to your checking account, and then you hand them the combination to your safe, right? You're just giving them all access privileges to your house. You're giving them free reign. And that's not very manageable. Um, Twitter used basic authentication for a long time. They eventually got rid of it because they didn't want people to be passing their username and passwords to a vendor who might store them improperly and then use them to make requests. And then you're just giving them the keys of the kingdom. Now you can tweet out all sorts of weird stuff, right? And they did, Twitter said, no, you want to be able to... OAuth is a very good strategy for consumer-facing API applications where you need to where a consumer needs to interact and give permission, right? OAuth is what Twitter uses, is what Facebook uses. You basically give, direct them to a login, and then it says, here's what this application wants to do, here's what it can't do, and then it sends back a token for that application to use to do those things, right? That's much more scalable, because those, tickets, or those tokens can be refreshed, they can be uh, revoked by the user at any time, much more scalable and uh, much better for security. All right, so let's look at some code examples. I'm going to look at the screen here because, um, oh, good. Okay, so that doesn't, that doesn't look too bad. I was worried that it would be too small. Uh, but let's go over what a controller looks like. So this, we're actually looking at some web API code. So we have here our employee's controller. It's just a class declaration that inherits from API controller. If you're using ASP.NET Core, you would just inherit from controller. And then we have our route at the top. We say we want this to be API version one of employees. All right, so cool, we're on our way. We're, we're implementing a good versioning strategy. I like that. And we got our get requests, which get data. We have the top one, which just returns a list of employees. And then we have the one below it, which returns one particular employee. And it has a little route attribute to say we expect an ID of type in to be here. And then we get that as an argument to our method. And then that gets executed. Awesome. Then we have our employee post, which um, takes an employee in. Now, if you've ever made an API in Visual Studio, you can create a new project and then right click on the controllers and then add, you know, create your model and then right click on the controllers folder and hit add controller. And then you can do something called scaffolding where it just, just generates all the code for you. And if you're using entity framework, it's like, double the awesome, right? Because then it just makes a controller for you that implements your gets, your puts, your your uh, posts and your delete, and it does it all against an entity framework database, which is awesome, right? It's actually not awesome. It's one of the things that's really bad, and it, there's a lot of maintainability problems around that. There's a lot of security problems too, such as how are we controlling what the employee object has on it? So now, is, does this mean that any property that they post back to this employee endpoint can be updated? What if there's a social security number, right? Or the opposite could be true. The get request include those by default, right? So that's bad, that's insecure. The better option is to use what's called a DTO, or data transfer object, or even a per request object. When I create APIs, all of my controllers, each of the requests has a different class associated with it for that request. So if I'm creating an employee, I'm, doing an, I'm creating a class called employee post request. It takes extra code, and it, but it's very explicit and it's very maintainable. 
And we'll talk about why in a little bit. What about this? Okay, so we've, we've implemented that and we just, we've said, let DTOs all the way, right? DTO all the things. So let's separate our concerns, right? This is a little, little harder to read, so I'll break it down for you a little bit. So we're taking an order, this is an order controller. So we're taking an order DTO so that a customer can make an order, right? So we're gonna create a new order. We're gonna add all the items in the order DTO to that order. And then we're gonna save it to the database. Okay, and then your controller, you know, your controller's done some magic and that's, and that's awesome, right? The problem is, is that the controller knows too much. The controller knows how to do too much. And you, so the bottom line is the controllers should be a traffic cop. They should be able to point out where things go, direct traffic like this, right? But they should never know how to do something. They should know where to go to do something, but not how. Okay, and we'll show, I'll give an example of that in just a second. We skipped this part, the part about bad request, right? We, we're up there, it says, if model state is valid, it's checking that order DTO to make sure that it's a valid object, then send back bad request. And that's good because we wanna send back bad requests so they'll fix it and uh, redo their order. Maybe there was no cart items in the cart for this order or something, right? So then we implement validation on our DTO, right? We can add those little attributes that say this parameter is required, here's the range, right? You can do that. Um, you can also inherit from iValidatable object which just provides a method, or not inherit, implement, iValidatable object, which provides a method called validate. And then you can say, you can do some custom validation logic that's, um, that's maybe more custom than just using those data annotations like required. Uh, the problem with this is that now the DTO knows too much about how to validate itself, right? And what if you need to access a database? right? You don't, there's, there's no hooks for us to create a new order DTO passing in our database container, right? You could new it up inside of there, but that's not really a good idea. So what are you supposed to do? We'll talk about that in a second. The bottom line is, is that's better, this is better than nothing, right? This is better than nothing. You should validate, 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 validate all the things. Assume that all data that you're getting is bad until you validate it. And you should separate your validation logic from your object. Your DTO should not know how to validate itself. Um, I like this library, it's called Fluent Validation. And what you end up doing is for an order DTO, you would create an order DTO validator class. And then you can test that independently. Here's what the architecture of a, one of, what an API that I would make uses. So we have a controller, the controller gets a request, the request gets routed to a validator, right? And then that validator, once it's passed that, it passes it on to a handler or a service that then processes that request. You notice everything is broken down. Yes, it's more lines of code, but as your API grows in complexity and you need to maintain it, it will save you tons of hours. It'll save you tons of time. And then of course, it's just good for separation of concerns and testability because we're all unit testing all these things, right? Right. Google Mediator, um, if you know, if you use a library called AutoMapper, which I use AutoMapper all the time, especially in Web API, um, Mediator was written by the guy, Jimmy Bogard. Um, it's an awesome library. It's a very simple, low API surface. It's a, good, it's a good one to implement the pattern where you go request, handler, that kind of thing. Mediator's awesome. Documentation is so critical, and there's a lot you have to think about. You have to think about the endpoints that you're documenting. You have to think about the parameters those endpoints take. You have to think about the schema of the data that you're sending and receiving. You have to talk about how it's formatted because if you're, because if you're using JSON and you're expecting a date, right? You want it in ISO 8601 format or maybe you want it in you know, short date time format. You have to specify that. You have to talk to the, you have to you know, engage with your users and tell them this is what you're expecting. And then you have to tell them about how to fix errors or how to manage exceptions, right? And there's so much that goes into this, making the, do the documentation easy to navigate, right? Making it easy to read, making it so that you document everything that allows them to go soup to nuts on your API, right? So you could you document authentication, for example, really important part to document. The bottom line is, is a good API lives and dies by its documentation. By far, I'd rather consume a bad API with, good doc with awesome documentation than a good API with no documentation at all, every time. Because if it's well-documented, at least it's at least I can expect, I can kind of work my, work my way through the muck, work my way through the weirdness, right? 
but it's a good API and I encounter a problem and the message that I get back is vague and there's no documentation, that sucks. But if it's, it's not a good API anyways, if it's got good documentation. Or it should be, if it's a good API, it's got good documentation. And you should tweet that out because that's awesome. It's like I thought of that and I was like, great. Maintaining your API. Uh, this is kind of a big one. This is a conversation that I had recently with one of the API vendors, which we have a lot of customers under, right? They said, hey, we're making uh, under, some, under the cover the changes. They're not, changing any of the, uh, they're not changing any of the objects. They're not changing any of the gits. They're just making some under the cover changes. But it shouldn't impact you. But let me know if it breaks something. Let us know if it breaks something. OK, that should send up a red flag. It's sent up like 100. For this company, it's no, this is no different, right? This is, just, this is just a normal day. Well, we said, hey, OK, you know, can we run our integration tests? Can you release it to test? So that way we can run our test suite against it and make sure everything's cool. Uh, no, we need it in an hour, so we're going to deploy it in an hour, right? So not only did they warn us that there could be breaking changes that not, they couldn't even anticipate, um, but they said, we're going to release it to production in an hour anyways. And you know, screw your customers if you have customers, right? Eh, this is like so totally wrong on so many levels, right? This is just a terrible idea. This is just terrible API practice. And I asked them about unit testing, and they're like, how are we supposed to do that? Unit test? What's that, right? So I knew that they weren't doing that, and that just made this even harder. Thankfully, there weren't any issues that time. Maintaining your API. A large part of it should be fixing bugs and optimizing. So you don't want to optimize too far ahead of time, right? You don't, premature optimization is the root of all evil. I live by that. Um, but if, you're, if there's opportunities for better performance and they're significant, then take them, right? You know, fix some bugs. If there's a bug with your API, fix it, right? Do what they expect. Don't do things like remove properties or add properties or even add properties. Because that, that we actually had that happen to one of our vendors. They added properties to their API much after they were released. And we actually had a property on there that, on our class, on our C Sharp class, that, that shared that property name. And so what it tried to do is it was, a, was giving us a string, and we were trying to deserialize it into a complex object. And then, of course, Newtonsoft.json said, you know, not, I'm magic, but I'm not that magic. So then that broke everything. Didn't break, it broke that one particular endpoint, and that was kind of sad. And we fixed it. But keep your APIs consistent, right? If you release it, if you've provided that contract, don't add and certainly don't remove, OK? So it's got eight minutes left. So this is the end of my talk. If you don't want more resources, um, go to rest.schneids.net. Follow me on Twitter. Look at my Twitter account. It's got a link to this as well. You can go to my website. I've got lots more information. Um, if I'll, I'll take some questions since I have some, have some extra time. So if anybody has any questions, if you want to leave, please feel free. But if you want to ask questions, by all means. Uh, but other than that, my name's Spencer. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening and uh, have a good rest of your NDC. <laughs> what questions do we have? So the question was, um, what about API? So we showed API, API versioning in the URL. We showed it in the header. What about in the query string for like Git requests, right? Um, I, I don't have any particular experience. My experience is that it's better than, my, my first initial thought is that it's better than header versioning, but still not as good as like putting it explicitly at the beginning of the URL. But at least it's a step in the right direction. So, but I would probably avoid it. I mean, if I were making an API. I might use it for minor versioning, but I have not even had an opportunity to do minor versioning on an API, so probably wouldn't do that either. Good question. Yes? Say that again. Oh, the question was uh, about uh, generating documentation. Uh, so there's some good tools out there to generate your doc, at least start on your documentation, because you really don't want to sit and like go property by property, like some of that can be done for you. Swagger is a good option. It's the one I use. Uh, but it's often used in substitute for like not documenting at all. And it's good 
but you should still fill in the gaps with like, here are the exceptions, here's how errors should look when, you're return when I'm returning a problem, here's how errors look, here's how you authenticate. You still have to bridge those gaps, but it's at least a good start. Good question. Yes? How do you handle versioning in code? Oh, great question. How do you handle versioning in code? Me personally, um, so the way that I structure my applications heavily relies on dependency injection. So what I do is I actually have my controllers in a completely separate library. And then when I start up my application, I use dependency injection to read, the, to read that library and then inject those different version controllers into my uh, ASP.NET runtime. So I, so I, you don't have to use dependency injection, you ought to. Um, but to answer your question specifically, usually I just store them in a separate project and just um, differentiate them by using different routes. Do you have any code examples? Um, do I have any code examples? I think the, let's see if I can find a good one here. Um, the one that I think would be most applicable if you could use your imagination just a little bit is um, if you could have an, employee, an employee's V1 controller right, that has that route prefix at the top. Eep. And then you can have another employee's v2 controller that has the different route prefix, API v2. You could keep them in the same library. I put them in separate libraries, personally, because I like to keep things separate. Separate is good. Great question. Great question. Yes? Can you talk more about the validation, like, uh, the, 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 so you said So the, the, the question was about validation, like if, I don't, if the object doesn't validate itself, uh, how do I validate it? So I use Fluent Validation, and Fluent Validation gives me, um, gives me a tool where I can just, I create a class, and I inherit from their validator class. And then I define my validation rules in the constructor. So it would say rule for first name is that it can't be empty. And empty means not an empty string uh, and not null. So that's how I handle that. I keep my validator separate from my DTOs or request objects. And do you pass the validation rules somewhere? Yeah, so, so the question was, do you, where do you pass the validation? So I have it hooked up in my pipeline such that my controller routes my request through, a val through the, all the validators that it can find. And then it goes, if, if, if all the validators pass, then it goes into my handler and actually does my service. Great question. Yes? Great question. So the question is, how do I handle deprecation, right? If I'm forced to break something, how do I, how do I handle that? Um, typically, um, in, an API wor in the API world, what you would do is um, you give the, or first of all, you give your consumers a lot of notice. If you deprecate it, that means that at some point you're in the near future, you want to retire it. Um, if you're going to do that, it's best to create another version of your, end, of your API, another version of that endpoint, and, allow, and then point them to that and say, you use that version. Um, at that point, you're probably thinking, at, at the point where you're probably thinking about doing that, you're probably looking to the future anyways to say, I'm going to implement API 2.0. But the worst thing you can do is give your consumers like very little notice. Nothing would piss them off more, seriously. Like if you gave them, ah, we're going to shut this API down in a month, like even six months isn't really enough like more like a year. But if you're doing that, you're probably looking at the next version of your API. Great question. Yes? So the, you had the order by and mm -hmm. then you had filter. Those are like kind of like, like query patterns. <coughs> they still have query patterns. Right, okay. right. And Okay, um, so the question was, is the ordering and filtering uh, using the query string, is that in the query string? Yes, and then, so, so and then. Query right, okay, so the question is about having a single query filterable query parameter versus multiples. Um, 
Using a, so you can use the um, filter parameter. If you're using OData, you can use that single one. Much more commonly, I don't see OData out in the wild much. I like it because it's convenient and it works well for what I use it for. But it's much more common to have multiple query parameters on an endpoint that um, filter it in some way. And they're all usually optional. So they could say it might be modified after or part of a certain category, and then you can filter it out um, based on based on the query parameters that you provide. And I see that much more commonly. But is, but is it a single get? Oh, okay. And, or, and is it a single get? It, yeah, it would typically a single get. Yep. Well, now I say typically, but I've never seen that. No, usually it's just one get with multiple query parameters. Great question. All right, well, I'm out of time, and I want to let the next speaker up on the stage. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much.